And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Goblin Scribe Gaming, creator of the recently released Class Toolkit Compendium for Low Fantasy Gaming, the one and only Brad Oldman. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing quite well, and yourself? I'm, do I'm doing good. Um, I am currently... I am currently in the I'm not going outside unless I'm getting paid phase of phase of the year. <laughs> no doubt that heat's atrocious, man. And my mentor called this time of the year the dog days. <laughs> right. The reason being, you may as well sweat like one. Exactly. <laughs> um, I know dog I know dog days of summer is a common is a common phrase in baseball. I don't know if I don't know if that's why it's referred to it in that in that sense. That's just how I, that's just how I see it. Because, well, if you if you could cool off more by sweating through your tongue, you'd in this kind of weather, you'd probably do it. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Oh, uh, so aside from the rampant drinking, especially when <laughs> especially when one of my l eternally late colleagues is uh, is on the program, um, I like to start with the humble beginnings. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, certainly. Um, so, I remember this honestly, like, it was yesterday in some cases. Um, I was I was 11, and I was at a friend's house, and it was his birthday, and he wanted to play D&D. &D. And I was like, alright, that's cool. And one of our friends had been, or mutual friends, had been running it, and um, his family was a bit religious, so they didn't let him you know, play that. So we actually kind of snuck it in and said it was Middle Earth. And for some reason, that was so much better, or that was okay in comparison. Um, but either way, it was, they, they let us play and everything like that. We had fun. Um, and it just, the, the, the creative level of freedom, it's something I had not experienced before other than just like drawing and such like that when I was younger. And so that stuck, and that was second edition, uh, AD&D, &D. and then we liked it so much, uh, me and my first DM at the time, um, and then another friend kind of broke off from that group because they moved away, and so we started playing a lot, and it just, it really stuck, and it's just the level of creativeness, the storytelling, the the fact that the game allows you to personalize the story makes it that much more immersive. Mm -hmm. um, and then shortly after that, our uh, DM at the time, my first major DM anyway, of uh, that group, he started getting a little bit more busy, uh, you know, got a girlfriend, all that. And long story short, he kind of drifted away and then ended up moving away. And so that just left me and my other buddy, Drake. Um, and I was like, well, you know what? I'll I'll take up the mantle. And so it was me and him for the longest time. Um, we played up through third edition, a um, little bit of Pathfinder. Um, we still keep in touch today, too. But um, yeah, so then we moved from that. And then he moved away, <laughs> which... You know, time is the killer of all good games. <laughs> um, and then we, uh, and then just we started finding other groups. He moved back. He came back for a game or two, and then um, so that's basically how it started. Uh, I was about eleven. And I'm like thirty, whatever, right now. So <laughs> there's a part of me that's all that's a bit curious if the, um, if the ver if the version of AD and D that. AD and D second that you started with was the black books. Actually, it was. Yes, you're absolutely correct. It was. Which um, the thing that I will the thing that I will always find funny about the black books is if you look in the first few pages of the player's handbook, there's the there's a big box that sa that says this is not AD and D third edition. You know, I remember that. I actually still have those books that my parents bought me so long ago. 
uh, from a local game shop that uh, unfortunately is not uh, nowhere around anymore. Um, but yeah, I still have those books. I mean, they're they're worn, but they're still you know usable and everything. So, but and then I actually also got the previous edition, not the not the black books, but the orange bound ones. Mm-hmm. I found a pile of those at a uh, flea market one time, and the guy was like. I'm selling them for five bucks a pop. And it had like everything from the player's handbook, monster's manual, fiend folio. And he's like, it's five buck piece or 25 for the whole bit. And it's like, you know what? I got 25 bucks. I'll just take them. And so I've ran in some of that too. Um, but yeah, it's nothing beats it, man. It's. Mm-hmm. And so given that, given that, given that it's uh... So so because of that you pro- you probably had to Did you have to have they could explain to you only once or multiple times? <laughs> uh just just once really. I mean it wasn't wasn't uh too bad. I, I honestly if you asked me what it was now I probably would need a reference but <laughs> um it is to, well, I know I know what it I know what it is to to this day it's just I've always had the mindset that Thaco is a de- is a decent idea that was poorly explained at the t- at the time. Right. Um, yeah. And in a weird way a bit of a re- a bit of a relic of the um war- of the wargaming days. Um, oh yeah, sure. I think that's what uh Gygax was going for, I well, believe. Well, keep keep in mind keep in mind a lot of D&D stuff is a successor to what was being done in Chainmail. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but w- some pe some people when some people when they do fantasy gaming, they're D and D lifers. While other people will experiment and jump and jump around. Did you and did you end up largely sticking with D and D, or did you um, experiment with other games? Let's say okay. So D and D definitely was the first, and we played that for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and my first DM actually brought in, uh, Mech Warrior, actually. Um, now that I think about it, that was one of the second games that I play. Um, that was fun. Um, I'm talking about the role-playing game, not the war game. There's actually yeah. a role-playing game for it, so. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what that is. And it, and no matter, no matter if it's the, um, war, if it's the war game or the role-playing game, Capellans ruin everything. <laughs> uh but yeah, I I remember that full heartedly. We got two full campaigns out of that, and that was awesome. Um, and we like to mix up the clans and the uh, inner sphere and all that, so that was fun. Um, but I tell you, in more recent times, in the past, like I'd say maybe a decade or so, Savage Worlds has really popped out to me too. Like mm-hmm. even though like I've played a ton of stuff, you know, Rifts of course, and uh, Shadow Run, chugging through those and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your what was your first introduction to Shadow to, not Sh- not Shadowrun but um, Savage Worlds? Was it just the Savage Worlds book itself, or was it one of the was it a game that was it a game or a setting that utilized the Savage Worlds um, toolkit? Actually, it's a fun story behind that. Um, the first uh, the f- the first uh, run in that I had with it. Uh, a buddy of mine, um, he had his own Shadowrun modification for it. And it was set, uh, you know, in our hometown and everything, too, which was kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Um, so my first, uh, it was the Traveler's Edition. I think that was two editions ago. Explorer's Edition. Oh, Explorer's Edition, right, right. That's, yeah, exactly, that one. And um, so we played that, and... Um, that was absolutely a blast uh playing a troll adept that was like eight foot tall and the sneakiest person in the group mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was fun but that's ironically the the first run in with savage worlds that i ever had and i honestly loved it ever since and i've played everything from uh, a modification of a D retro clone on it um to um, I played a little bit of Deadlands. That's always fun, and then of course now I use it for my own homebrew stuff too. So it's it's a super awesome system. It yeah. really is. Um, 
Now, how how did you how did you first come across low fantasy gaming? So, uh, that uh, it was me getting tired of running really super crunchy games for fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, now, no, obviously, no disrespect to like Pathfinder or Five E or anything like that, but I played a lot in my time. I, I've ran a lot of three point oh all the way through Pathfinder, um, and. It just, it, I got tired of having to say no to certain things because I didn't want them in my world. I would rather say yes to a bunch of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just because there's so many options. And, you know, that's ov- obviously one of its perks, you know, 3.5 and Pathfinder, is there's just so much there that you could just pull from. And, you know, I'll, I'll never discredit it for that. But it's just running it is just after time it's it just it, it takes too long it's it's not uh you know something that i care to do but like if say if somebody was said hey let's go play some pathfinder i wouldn't question it or i'd play it in a heartbeat as long as i don't have to run it mm-hmm. so i looked i looked around and you know anything from like shadow of the demon lord to castles and crusades um even ran into the Tunnels and Trolls guys at Gen Con a couple years ago, which they were super nice. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it just, I, I started looking around and I found this little fantasy gaming and I was looking on YouTube and found some reviews and such like that. Um, and so I watched some of Steve's videos on like how to play the game and I'm like, this is great. Like it's, it's a mixture. It, it gives me that second edition feel that I miss. From because second edition and third edition are so vastly different, and it also has that modern aesthetic where it's like, hey, we're not going to bog you down with a thousand different rules. Uh, you know, if if you feel like this is something you need to do, just do it. Because with the crunchier systems, you you change one thing. Um, you know, sometimes they can make oh, it's like a chain reaction. It's like some other things can go it's haywire like the, if you it's just like the world's worst version of Jenga. <laughs> Exactly. But again, not to disparage those. Those are awesome games in their own right, and I'd play them in a heartbeat. But um, just running them, is, it, just, it doesn't fit what I'm trying to do as a, as a GM for my in-person group. Mm-hmm. Now, how did, I'd like you to walk me through the, the uh, process that you ended up going down from, um, contr- from being, being somebody who was, who was playing the game to somebody who's, um, trying to, th- trying to toss in his own, his own community rules and now a full on, pu- a full on published expansion. Well, honestly, that was, that was a thing that was on my bucket list for the longest time back when, uh, me and my friend Drake that I mentioned earlier, like we'd always play in his, uh, his parents' basement and his mom would always come down and say, you know, you should do something with this. And, you know, teenage me, okay, whatever, you know, that's cool. Um, but now I've been, as I got older, I was like, you know, that's not a bad idea. And, uh, you know, before, you know, before the internet blew up the way it did and everything, it's like not, it wasn't as easy to get things published. And I mean, it's still, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like incredibly easy, um, but it's definitely more convenient. And so low fantasy gaming clicked with me on a level that no other fantasy game had clicked with me in a while. And, you know, after watching Steve's videos and then, you know, falling in love with the Artificer, I was like, you know, I need to make something. And then wanting to switch from Pathfinder to this, um, you know, I, I had to think, okay, well, what would my players want? And so I was looking through, and the Bard and the Barbarian, for example, stood out to me. And they were like, okay, so they're they're still good classes as a design, but they didn't have the list of abilities to select from. And I assure you, my players love options, and it, sometimes it helps them creatively, too. Um, so I was like, all right, I'm going to do... I'm going to make the Barbarian and the Bard like the rest of the classes in the deluxe book mm-hmm. of Low Fantasy Gaming, and... That's where it started. Well, that in the Druid class is where it started. And it was basically me making something for my group. And I was like, well, you know what? The community is super nice, super helpful. 
Um, why not just post it for them too? You know, share the creativity. Mm -hmm. And you specifically mentioned the artificer as as one as one of the things that brought you into the fold. What is it about that particular class that stood out to you? I have always been a fan of you know, gadgetry in the medieval fantasy type thing. Like any, like it, it all started back when I was younger and it's like, you know, grappling hook crossbows and, you know, stuff like that. And then, um, the second edition, uh, uh, complete thieves guide had weighted sleeves and, you know, just like little things like that. And then that started to progress. And I've just always been a fan of like that weird, I guess for lack of a better term, weird science slash alchemy mm -hmm. that it, it does still fit in the medieval thing, but you're always, it's just as weird as like magic would be in that. And it's just, it's always been a fan. I've always been a fan of it. And the way Steve had his artificer designed is it just, it hit all the right points for me. And I was like, this is great. So that's, that's what kind of stood out to me on that one. Mm -hmm. So with this particular, um, with this particular toolkit, now this now this is essentially a collection of the stuff that you are putting out on the community end of things. And as I understand it, it's a themed set of um, of unique of unique fe of unique features um, for each for each particular class. So the first it thing the f the first thing that I'd like to ask is um, was it was it what well, you had mentioned you had mentioned say the barbar you'd mentioned say the barbarian as one of the one of the things you had set up but within each of the classes you have it set up where they're categorized into into different themes um was that something that just naturally settled on or were, or um was that or was there a particular journey to get to that point well um the unique feature idea is another thing that actually kind of drew me to it but the thing is, these are actually class abilities. So, like, the fighter has adaptations. These are, like, expansions to that. Now, I actually have um, one of the guys that actually pulled me over to the Discord. Uh, I think he goes by Complex Deer. Um, he he was the one that was on Reddit with me um, when I was first getting into it and said, hey, come over to Discord and share this stuff. This is good. Um, he, uh, he pulled me over, and so I started there. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And basically what I did was is when I started with a barbarian, I didn't have that. But when I started with the bard, which was the next step, I did, and then I went back and changed the barbarian. So the whole idea is to make these abilities say, okay, if you want to make something like for example, just because I have the artificer in front of me here, say you wanted to make an alchemist, it's like here's here's a few things that you could start with or here's a few things to give you ideas um to essentially get it going and such um it's just it's not to restrict it's more so to just say hey here's the idea of what these are for and then you can just, you're it's meant to pick but i actually have had people come to me and say hey i use these for unique features instead for a more low powered game and apparently it works for that too. So, uh, you know, if I'm all about, you know, creativity breeding more creativity, so that's that's uh, an honor to me as a as a creative uh, writer and such. Mm -hmm. Now, when it can, even though even though it's clear that the that these that even though they're categorized in a certain way that these can be mixed and matched, were there any were there any um any ca were there any cases in particular where you realized you had to put in some special um, caveats specifically for that class? Um yeah, actually, because like for example, um, let's see here. Like for example, the uh, since I got the artificer in front of me here, um, the monstrous graphing, um, you know, they they can get some uh pretty crazy stuff going on there or constant abilities that don't require uses of your abilities like the other classes do and so 
instead of just restricting you saying, hey, you have to meet this criteria or something like that, I was just like, okay, here's here's a level cap for it. Like, okay, or not cap, but like a gate. So essentially you can't take those until your fifth level because it, um, it implies that at that point you've gained enough skill to do that. Like I think even the ranger for that matter too, um, like the planner walker and druidic training, it's like, you're not going to start with those things. It's not something that a novice ranger or novice artificer, uh, would really start with. It's, it's something that should be built up to. And I think at least in my intentions anyway, that it, that helps build more character as you're growing. Cause if you have something to work towards, you know, that, that helps the story out and that helps the DM out too. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes, now, when it comes to, when it comes to some, when it comes to some of the, um, archetypes that you that you had were there were there any instances where you ended up right ended up writing yourself into a corner with a certain idea and realized you had to dial it back yeah actually um with like the rogue um i have the shadow magic mm-hmm. um i was getting a little crazy with it at some point so i was like eh, let's just kind of push that back um but i mean and, and then even the uh the magic user, like, using, uh, from, like, my Bloodbound and such, um, there is some of the monstrous abilities that you would get in place of the normal magic user. I had to make sure that whatever I was putting in there wasn't too crazy, or it, it didn't overshadow the normal magic user's abilities, because, uh, I know there, there's some out there that you know if, if it's if it's more powerful you know why not take it i, I wanted to make sure that um uh, you were building outward instead of upward um kind of like how savage worlds actually does with their edges and such you you always build with more to do instead of just you know increasing numbers constantly and that was kind of an overall uh feel of how i was trying to do this And give, given that, given that, um, were the when now I'm now when I came to when I came to play when I came to play testing some of the um, fe- some of the features that are in that are in the compendiums, um, were there any were there any that resulted in builds that you didn't exactly account for? No, honestly, um, I mean not really, not that I can recall. I did have to play around with the druid's wild shape a little bit um, to kind of get that feel right. Because if you if you dialed it up to a certain point, it was too powerful. And then if you basically restricted it too much, it wasn't useful at all. So where I got it right now, where it's um, you can choose an animal of a hit die that's... Uh, a minimum of one, but my uh, it's basically it has to be within your level minus three. Um, so by the time you're third level, you're still only picking one hit die creatures, but you're still keeping your own hit points and stuff. Mm-hmm. I had it originally where it's just you could choose animals, and then um, when I, I did that on uh, Reddit there at first, I, and then it was brought to me like testing, and then Steve even mentioned too, it's like. Yeah, that could be a little, little broken because some of the animals in there are pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I tried, I, you know, I, I tried to dial it down a little bit, and so I set it on the, you know, hit dice minus three, um, because I felt that it kept a huge amount of utility, but also didn't completely debunk the level of power that that would have. All right. I... I can I can certainly see that. And when um now when it comes to right, one of the one one of the con, one particular bit of contention that I've seen when it comes to expanding certain um character arch, character archetypes is when it comes to expanding casters. Cuz a lot of people have the argument of just give them more spells. To and 
personally, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're on the same page with me on this, but I would always contest that. I think I think if there's one thing that that uh, magic users and the like have too much of, it's spells. You know, and that's exactly what I tried not to do uh, when I was de designing the specialist magic and the bloodbound. Um, for this, as I didn't want to just say, okay, here, here's a list of spells, because the magic user in uh, LFG is is a bit different than the other classes. It, it doesn't get a use per level kind of deal. It just has it has a spell usage mm -hmm. chart all its own. So I thought to myself, I was like, okay, what can I do to the magic user? Because I can't build it like the rest of the classes. So I was like, okay, it has a second level and a seventh level ability. So whatever I make for that, why not balance it against those two? And it just changes the class altogether. But you also don't have to make a whole list of new spells or anything like that. Because the spells he's got in there, honestly, if you just like tailor an element or you tailor the way something looks, it's almost a whole different spell because he's got the he's got the basics and more so in there. Um, so yeah, I just, I tried to just replace the class abilities as to the spells and give them more spells and such, because yeah, I agree with you. It's yeah. You, magic users already have enough spells, uh, especially for a mid low fantasy type setting that the LFG is really good for. Mm -hmm. Well, just in general, um, a long time ago, I did an experiment, um, covering the pages of spells ratio with several books. Um, D and D and Pathfinder were the two biggest offenders. <laughs> Just in ter in terms of pages to pages total in the core book versus or player's handbook, or and the amount of pages that are dedicated to just spell effects. Um, Pathfinder was slightly worse, but they were but by slightly I mean like a six or so page difference. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, that's not that's not much, but there, but you still had you still had you still had almost a quarter of the book dedicated to just spells, which is right. kind of pushing it. Um, does make me understand why why some why some old school games have spe have spells in, as their own book. No doubt. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you there too. It's it's literally like some of these newer games, and again, not they're you know not to hate on them or anything there, of course. But uh, yeah, it's just like everything has magic, and it's like I try. I did a little bit of that in here, but what I wanted to do is not necessarily recreate the wheel. Like if a spell already did an effect that I was going for, there's absolutely no reason I shouldn't just reference that spell and say, hey, the duration is lesser because it's doing something a little bit different but maybe more powerful maybe less powerful so that's that was kind of a goal there too and of course it's if not they... it's not like this is a new problem because if if you recall there was there was a full-on letter by letter encyclopedia series of ex of expansions that were just spells with a d and d right yeah it's crazy how many spells they have sometimes there like a th a two hundred page book for each let for each letter of the out for several letters of the alphabet. <laughs> right. I actually recall I have a supplement for I think it's Shadow of the Demon Lord, and it's literally it's just a book of magic, and it's like eight hundred spells in this in a book that's almost the same size as the uh, like the actual handbook itself. It's crazy. Which is funny because of because of how. Um, getting spells works in Shadow of the Demon Lord. You're not going even at even at the high even at the highest tier. You're not going to be having that many spells, right? Yeah, the guys over there they they do a real good job of balancing that. I think that mm -hmm. um, it's it's that's showing you how to make a bunch of spells without like overdoing it. Because I don't. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely there. Um, now. When it come when when it comes to when it comes to some of the some of the classes that you ex, that you expanded on, um, were there any instances where you where um, an ability that you were putting in you had to take out because it was a little too similar to 
a ability or an effect that was already in that was already in place uh, yeah actually um <laughs> there is a couple um I, I can't think of the actual specifics but i remember writing some of these down i think it was the rogue actually mm -hmm. and i was writing them down and then i looked over to kind of cross-reference the deluxe book and i'm like well damn it you know <laughs> It, there it is right there. It's just worded differently. So I had to just kind of rework it and such there. Um, now, I do have a bit of a build question since we brought up magic earlier. Um, of course. If somebody if somebody wanted to get a little gishy, if you'll if you'll forgive me for using for using the nomenclature, um, <laughs> How would how would the, what would they probably want to take from the toolkit compendium in order to pull that off? Well, okay. So the cool thing about the toolkit compendium here is, like, for example, the the cross class uh, unique features um, in the the deluxe book. These can be picked from from that too. Like, so say you're a fighter, but you want to cross class into magic user to do the classic, you know, fighter mage type deal. Um, you know, you could do that. Um, but it, or for example, like if you wanted to be a rogue that dabbled in gadgetry, you could take an artifice and you have all these options here. Um, that you can choose from. And I just wanted to like help expand upon that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But yeah, that's that's what I would recommend is yeah take those cross class features and you know use some of this uh, from either my compendium or the deluxe or the companion books and mm -hmm. yeah you could totally make that bordering dual class sort of character that you're wanting to do and I think that's one of the geniuses in the design of this game too is the unique features that like it's like okay here's a taste of that other level but it also doesn't uh, hold your core class back. It's like you could still be a fighter, but if you want that gun from the artificer, that black powder weapon, you totally have it. And to be fair, to be fair, um, a artificer you, you using a gun as their as their as their claim to fame, there is a there is a strong tradition of that, namely. The later, the later end of the wiz of the wizardry and might and magic series, respectively, because um, the tail end of those games gets weird. <laughs> <laughs> like like eight angels or angels are actually are actually hyper advanced robots and demons are aliens. Weird. Yeah, you know sometimes it's it's cool when stuff gets weird like that, but at the same time. It's like, where should you start and where should you end with it? Yeah, like it's it could be really fun or it could just be, get like super gonzo. Then again, um, given given the fact that I, given the fact that I ha that even though it's a terrible terrible game, I have t I have taken cues from some of the monsters in World of Cinnabar, least of which being the flying clam that can breathe fire. Or the bear that shoots laser beams from its eyes. <laughs> um, right. Like. Um. <laughs> World of Cin <laughs> yeah, I got tongue tied for a second. World of Cinnabar is one is one of those things that where I love the bonkersness of the se of the setting and the bonkersness of some of the writing. I will not ever run the game unless I'm getting pa unless I'm getting paid. And how and um, the amount that the amount that would be my fee is in, is an amount that you can't afford. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, bonkers does have its place and everything, but um, you got to know when. You well, know, it's. I see a I see a lot of I see a lot of the I see a lot of the old school crowd who tr who try who try and bring a a degree of his of historical of historical realism. Into into play or tr or try and make things a little bit closer to um, to how th how things were in medieval Europe, 
and I'm of the mindset of I'm I'm in the mindset of that's nice and all, but there's no reason why we can't go complete bat shit. I mean, one of my first D one of my first um D and D modules that I, I didn't I didn't run this I was playing was Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which is a which is a rather infamous one because it starts out in it starts out in fantasy and then all of a sudden goes sci-fi. You know, honestly, I've been a fan of like throwing sci-fi into fantasy a little bit, mm. but you, you've got to do that right amount. I actually played in a 5e game um, at a local bar of mine, uh, or not mine, but nearby. And um, the DM, he he was great. Like it was kind of like an apocalyptic future sort of deal, but it was still fantasy, and it was built on top of our world. You'd, um, you'd probably get a kick out of Numenera. You know, I've heard lots of good things about that, to be honest with you. Um, and Monty Cook's not a bad guy, so he's not a bad guy now. Now, now that now that he's wor- now that he's gotten that whole ivory tower design mindset out out of his head, <laughs> right? Is that's that was part of the reason for some of the unfortunate design choices in in vanilla third edition, and why. As much as people complained ab- about about um about the existence of a three point five, going back and looking at what um what the original third edition looked like, it was necessary. There were problems. Yeah, I mean, when you get too many options there, uh, I mean, sometimes that that could deter players and such like that. Um, I have certainly had my fair share of different players and. Some of them love the idea of, hey, you know, I have a labyrinth of options to do. But then some of them are like, there's too much to pick from. I don't know what to pick, you know. Um, so a lot of times I just, in my groups anyway, I just end up making stuff up for them. And just like, hey, here's what I have in mind. Is that cool with you? Or they'll tell me, or they'll tell me what they have in mind. It's like, for example, my fiance, she'll be like, I want it to look like this and she'll show me a movie or a book or mm-hmm. whatever. And then she goes, I want it to do that. And I'm like, all right, cool. And so we'll figure out, I'll figure out the mechanics for her and just make something up. Honestly. Well, that that's the, that's the big seat. That's the big secret. We're making this stuff up as we go. <laughs> right. Um, now that, that being said, that being said, were there, were there um was there what was there any particular class that it would that it was trickier to add things simply because there's a, simply because it covers a lot of ground as it is you know at first two of them um the the ranger uh like i got like a couple abilities down and then it just didn't nothing stuck like i would th- i would go pull up the file because i had a file for each class mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd, I'd throw if i get an idea i'd throw one on there and if it i come back to it later and you know it if it felt right i would keep it if it didn't you know i'd toss it but yeah the ranger did that to me and to a degree the monk did that to me but just in a different way um how different well for example the the ranger it it came between like okay, so there's something very close to it already there that if somebody wanted to take like a cross class of uh, unique feature, or the ranger already had it, mm-hmm. um, or there was a spell that was exactly like it that they could do the cross class feature with, um, but like the monk for example, like I had ideas, like I had like all the like the names of what I wanted in there because I wanted to use. I wanted to pull from real world history a little bit too, because that's mm-hmm. always fun. And it was more so it's like some of the fighting styles, there's so much to them. It's like I was I was literally having paragraphs of stuff and I was like, ah, I need to dial this back a little bit. Um because the overall goal of this is I want these abilities to read really well. And I don't want you to have to, you know, decode rules just to figure out what they do i just want to read it that's what it does and if you like it pick it you know Mm -hmm. 
now when it com when it comes to now one of the one of the other big things that that's added to the sandbox with the, with this particular document is the introduction of a druid class and obviously you weren't the you weren't the first one to do, to do a druid for uh, low fantasy gaming and you're probably not going to be the last but tell me about the tell me about the route that you want that you wanted to take and what you wanted to not do well with the druid that was the first thing that I actually made cuz i was looking at the deluxe book and the pdf cuz i just ordered it on drive through and I was like, this this game doesn't have a druid class. And then um, I looked on the community content website, and uh, my buddy JD has this really awesome historical druid class. It's like, it's not like your typical fantasy druid. It's it's more steeped in actual real life lore. And I tell you, he's got a huge knack for that. So uh, if you're listening to this, go check him out on Drive Through because JD Productions is. He he does the historical stuff so well, it's mm -hmm. crazy. Um, so I was like, well, I can't just copy him. You know, that's 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 not right to him. So I was like, I'm going to make a classic fantasy drew. Like what, and people that come into D and D or Pathfinder or whatever, that's what they they expect. So I was like, all right, I got to do the classic fantasy drew. So I was like, what's the first thing I got to do? It's like I, I kind of went back and forth with the animal companion and decided. Yeah, it, it, if somebody wanted it, you know, have it take it as a unique feature or something later on. But Wild Shape was the biggest thing, because that was one thing all the other classes in low fantasy gaming didn't have. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a Wild Shape. So then I started looking around, trying to figure out how I wanted to do it, and uh, Sudden Transmogrification is basically Polymorph. And I was like, all right, I'll just use that as a basis. And so the Wild Shape is definitely... Um, was the the core that I wanted to focus on a little bit, and then of course nature magic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. When it came to designing Wild Shape, were were did you have to redo it because you felt it was get it was getting overpowered in some in some early drafts? Well, in the earliest draft, honestly, I didn't have a, a hit point cap or hit die cap, I should say. Um, it was just like if if the hit die equaled your level, that was cool. And some of the creatures can get pretty brutal because low fantasy gaming is all about that grit and danger. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I was like, okay, so I, I don't want to dial it back too much, um, but I also don't want to get it to the point where it doesn't do anything. So... Uh, hit die minus three was what I kind of settled on, and that kind of felt right. Mm -hmm. um, just because for the first three levels, it's just a huge utility. Well, the, it comes at second level, so the second and third level, it's it's a, just a big utility. You know, you could turn into a mouse, or you could turn into a hawk, or something like that. And then as it as you get higher level, it kind of shows that you know the druid's gaining more power. And they have more control over it, and you know you can get uh, bigger creatures and such like that out of it. Mm -hmm. And the when it and the other the other thing that I was that I was curious about when it comes to when it comes to the druid is um were there is were there any pitfalls you had when it came to designing the toolkits for the druid? I don't, you know, honestly, no. The the they kind of came naturally. Like, I didn't think about them at first, like when I first designed the jury, because I wasn't even into the kits thing there. But when I was designing them, um, honestly, I was like, okay, well, what don't I have? Because that that was the biggest thing. And then, so I decided on um, the three that I have there. The uh, the Mire Weird, the Fey Warden, and uh, the Spore Herder. And the reason I kind of went with those is I always felt druids could dabble in Fey magic because, you know, Fey's live in, like, nature-ish type settings. Yeah. Usually. And so the Fey Warden was a natural progression. It was like, okay, cool. I'll just use some of that. And um, I wanted each of the kits to have something to add to Wild Shape. Like, you could take it as just a, a passive class ability as you level up, 
And so, of course, you know, you can turn into a fey creature. Um, and then the Meyer Weird uh, oozes. But I also, I took the Meyer Weird uh, and the Spore Herder to some extent. Um, I got inspiration from uh, Swamp Thing and Man Thing from DC and Marvel, respectively. Uh, just the ideas, because, I mean, they're not the exact same thing, obviously. But um, that's why you have an ooze form and a fungus form mm-hmm. uh, that you got there. And I remember that I remember that there was one that there was one similar one in um, Spawn's universe. I just can't remember the name off the top of my head. Oh, it, you mean like a plant-like creature? Or? Yeah, it was the green a... something. It was the green something. I just can't remember. I just can't remember what. I just can't remember what off the top of my head. You know, it's like right on the tip of my tongue too. I honestly can't recall that offhand. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now I remember. It's um, it was Green World. Oh okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, which is which was part was part was part of the Rogues Gallery. It's es- essentially a essentially the uh, the a a na- a living nature planet. Um. And and what and um, it's t- it was tied to the heap, which was part of Spawn's Rogues Gallery. Right, right. The heap. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of those like always those monstrous type characters and stuff. So yeah, it's been a while since I've read Spawn, but yeah, now that I'm actually looking at it here, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And. Whenever, when I will, I will note that when when I when I needed to find um, quote unquote druidic music, I obviously going with nature themes would be would be obvious. But I wanted to have it to where it is a kind of nature where if you're in this place, you do not belong. Because. Because that, because I feel like that's the that's the kind of um, fringe, fringe of civilization that a druid should be in. Like rangers and barbarians are are gonna be are gonna be out on the fringes of the of civilized parts of a given setting, but I feel like druids should go one step further than that. No, I, I believe you're right. I've always been a fan of druids being, you know, like of the, almost like a outside of civilization secret society type of deal and yeah no i i'm completely with you on that um i've always been a fan of the druidic language not being publicly known like they don't teach it to civilized folk if you will mm-hmm. <laughs> like i've always loved that idea and it, it just it adds a mystique to them uh that some of the other classes don't really have or I, it takes it it makes them their own unique thing. Yeah. Um. Uh, which does does make me does make me ask how. Um. So there's a few there's a few classes that could be considered a bit more common, and I'd be curious how you how you'd approach them to make them a bit more unique. Um. I'll go I'll go with one I'll go with one of the obvious ones in fighter because. Fighter is treated as ba- as Babby's first um, class for a lot in a lot of games. <laughs> yeah, so the fighter, um, there's there's only one ability that's not one of their standard like stance like abilities that the adaptations uh, give you. And <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me, and that's the uh, the commander part of it where you basically it's it's to imply that's under the warlord kit it's to imply that you're basically barking orders at your allies and basically granting them the abilities that you have um because it allows you to give transfer your default adaptation whatever you decide to pick that as Mm -hmm. to them to kind of help them out um so that's the only one that's the only non-adaptation to the the fighter that's not like a stance ability but at the same time 
the very first um <clears throat> excuse me the very first uh kit that i made for that is the chained dervish because i've always been a fan of a chained fighter and i just feel like other role playing games it's like you have to build way too much you have to take too many abilities or take up too much of your you have to pay to not players. suck yeah exactly it's like Okay, you start out like with this exotic weapon, and sure, yeah, you've been trained in it, but you still suck at it compared to somebody that just has a sword. But at the same time, these big chains, if somebody knows how to use them, it's probably going to be a little more deadly than a sword. So that's what I was kind of going with the uh, chained dervish. Um, that's why I even made it a, a weapon in there too. Um, I, am I wanted to. I am curious oh. if you went if you want if you wanted a chain because you grew up playing Castlevania. You know, uh, that wasn't too far off from an inspiration either. Um, but between that and I think uh, Chain Devils from the... I think they're three point whatever. Um, I've always been a fan of those in terms of infernal creatures too. Um, so that was another thing. Um, but I just always thought the idea of um, somebody fighting with these chains, these, this unorthodox weapon, this this weapon that could easily just flail back and smack you in the face. Somebody skilled with that would be insanely dangerous. And there's actually a guy in my games that I play in on Fridays that uses this, and it's super awesome to watch him play that. Um, like, switching between the different, like, the momentum, the pr preservation, and the relentless ones. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's cool to watch him shift based off of what needs to be like there was one instance where he was surrounded by zombies so the momentum and the relentless or the well just the momentum is not going to do it because it's range he's actually surrounded by him so he he kept switching between preservation which wrapped the chain around him and made him like armor and the relentless which is kind of like a wild swing um and basically just fought his way out of him and it was crazy mm -hmm. um but like it didn't seem overpowered either, which was great, which made me really happy because that was a possible concern there. But it was just cool to see him shift between those just in that one stance um, to get that going and to basically fight, basically bully his way out of this horde of zombies that he was in. Yeah, and I I haven't had somebody use a full use a full on fighting chain or spike chain, but what I have had someone use in in one of my campaigns was a meteor hammer. Oh, those are fun. <laughs> Which, <laughs> um, so I've I've seen people use that. I've seen people use a. There was one person who used a Monriki Kusari. Yeah. Which, imagine a Kusari Gama, but you just have two. You just have um two weights instead of a sickle instead of a weight and a sickle. Oh jeez, yeah, that would be deadly. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I like I said, I'm I'm always I'm always in favor of of the more Gonzo end of things, and and um, there's plenty there's plenty of examples of chain weapons in in fi in fiction, sure. especially especially in popular fiction. So, wh so why not why not embrace that? I agree. And that's actually why I put the weighted chain in the uh in there too as the base weapon. Um I just I I I'm with you 100% on that. It's the chain fighter is just so cool. Mhm. Mm oh. Or the idea of it, I should say. Plus it's it's one of those things that you could easily see getting getting some use in um, if a character had a background as say a um pet fighter. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm, absolutely. Oh. Granted, some some may see it as a bit cheap to abuse trip mechanics with that kind of thing, but um, if it but in the in the words of House Curita, if it fits, I sits. <laughs> right, right. Um. Now, when now um, one of the other things I one of the other things I had note I had noticed that you put in was um was the folio of classic races. Um, sure. How did, how did, what was the reasoning for inclu for including that in the compendium? Well, that was actually kind of a, a spur of the moment thing when I first made it. Um, <laughs> it's in the, in the discord, there was a 
streamer that was doing a low, like a, a mini game. It was like a five or six session thing. And it was, it was Greyhawk, but he was using uh low fantasy gaming for it. And it was awesome. Like mm-hmm. it was very awesome. So there was that. And then at that time too, there was a lot of dark sun talk like in the group or in the mm-hmm. discord. And uh, everybody was like, well, low fantasy gaming would be really good for, you know, dark sun. And since the, wizards isn't doing anything you know why don't you know that'd be cool if that could be a setting alongside the midlands which is also another great setting too um so i was like okay um since there's only the the small amount of races in the low fantasy gaming book um i was actually downstairs in my basement by my bookshelf um looking through some books to prep for a game at the time and i started looking through some of my old second edition books and such and I, I just started writing this up. Now, at the beginning, we're like the alternate attribute bonuses and the generalizations for the sizes. That wasn't in the original. I just had the um, I just had the races, and I tried to emulate second edition essentially, um, just to give people more options. Of course, um, you know, because I know there's going to be people out there that you know want to play orcs and halflings and gnomes and such like that. Um, they want to go more mid fantasy or put these races into, you know, a low fantasy or even, Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, I figured it would be a good way to do it. And second edition emulates it good enough to where it's like, it doesn't seem too powerful, you know, because with third edition, it just, it's, they're great. There's a lot of cool stuff there, but when you bring it into low fantasy gaming, it, it might get a little bulky and it might offset the balance a little bit. Mm-hmm. I I do appre- I do appreciate that with that in all of the mentions that you that you did not one not one of them involved elves because fuck elves. <laughs> you sound like one of my players, honestly. <laughs> I how many how many times how many times in fantasy setting can 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 it be can it be described as el- as elves being the reason why the world ends up going to shit? That's a Oh, that's exactly what happens with both Warhammer, Warhammer 40k, and um, Kings of War. Local elf ruins everything. Oh, one of my players would really appreciate you saying that. That's hilarious. Plus some. Um, I am I am a purveyor of what of what is professionally known as dwarven diplomacy. Yeah, dwarves are pretty awesome, honestly. So of course, dwarven diplomacy is just a euphemism for for um, insulting someone for five minutes. True. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Plus, I, plus, I I had a soft spot for the for the dwarf it, for the dwarven insult in um in that in that Warhammer's Quest video. <laughs> right. Oh. But there's a. But and even even with that, I I d- the last thing I wanted to touch on is the u- is the whole unique features thing. When it came to those, was it were were they put in the back in that manner simply because you couldn't um you couldn't na- you couldn't nail down putting them in within the class itself? Well, honestly, in the original Druid, I didn't have that. Um, like because I mean the cross class skills are pretty. Uh, basically they they don't really vary off too much um so the druid class i just added that in and i just figured coupling it with the unique features instead like they do in the deluxe book would probably be a smarter thing to do since there's only two of them in there and then the find familiar was actually a part of the specialist magic um uh document that i originally had and since that was just for formatting purposes and stuff, I just decided, okay, I'm just going to have a unique features, even though it's just two of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just going to find some really cool old school art and pop that on there and then um, put those on there. All right. I got, I got you. Now I do want, I do want to congratulate you on how, on how many um, downloads you've gotten that you've gotten thus far with the expansion. Um, what, What's been what has been some of the um, takeaways that you've gotten from play from playtesting with the with the toolkit? 
Um, well, uh, the uh, race folio, for example, um, that's why I added in the alternate attribute rules and such like that, or attribute bonuses and such. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing because um, I got some feedback, I mean, even before the compendium came out, saying, hey, you know, give a heads up, I've used the folio, but the bonuses, you know, since it's a roll under system, um, they didn't necessarily break the game. But for that GM, they were just kind of like, eh, it's, it's it's a little too much, you know? And I was like, okay, that's cool. I appreciate that and everything. So that's why I was like, all right, let's try this instead and see if mm -hmm. this works. And um, so that's how that started. Um, uh, the Druid's been through a small bit of revision. Not a whole lot, though. And I've gotten some really good uh, thoughts on it. So I might actually expand on the Druid in, in the future. Um, you know, just add more kits to it and... Instead of just redoing it all together, because uh, mm -hmm. it's all, I, I think it, the way it plays right now, I think is great. Um, but I have a couple buddies that are like, "Hey, what about this idea? What about this idea?" And they're basically alternate versions of what's on there. And it's like, all right, well, maybe down the line I'll do a, another, uh, like another druid kit or an alternate feature kit, kind of like I did with the uh, barbarian alternate rages and the bard alternate inspire greatnesses with that. Mm -hmm. And I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that develops and how the players inevitably find new and interesting ways to break it, because that's <laughs> because that's how this works, right? But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. <laughs> Absolutely, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return. Whether whether it's to whether it's to discuss why why everybody is wrong about scions or just a shit post, um, the door is always open. As Thank I often you. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Indeed. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>